what up with your crooked gang member cops don't trust police? Well, if we have a gang member who's a cop, he's not going to be a cop for long, all right? If they're crooked, they're not going to be a cop for long. So if you have any information to that regard, please let us know. In fact, we have a, an entire phone number, 1-800-A-DEPUTY. I believe is a number you can call to report criminal activity. And uh, LESD.org also has a link on that website. You can call and you can also report criminal behavior. We're not going to tolerate it. And since I've been in office, I've had the... Uh, the unfortunate uh, duty to, to terminate 57 employees that are employees of mine. And uh, they did it for a variety of reasons. Uh, some of them were arrested by other agencies or faced a charge from another agency and we took the information, we did what we had to do, we took appropriate administrative action. Same thing when they came to attention of our department, we were actually the ones that did the criminal investigation, presented to the district attorney's office and did the made the administrative moves necessary to terminate the employee. So we are holding our own accountable. All right, so this story is a complicated one. It has many pieces. Let me try my best to break it down. Now, if you recall, there was a shooting of a young man in L.A. County, uh, Andreas Gordardo, okay? From that, there stemmed a whistleblower who was an, actually an L.A. County Sheriff's Department deputy, Art Gonzalez. Now, he blew the whistle on the fact that there was this gang, a, a literal gang within the Compton Police Department of deputies who were called executioners. Now, they sported, many of them sported tattoos of... Um, uh, a skeleton with a Nazi type headgear, as well as an AK 47 with flames in the background. Now, what Officer Gonzalez, you can see the image there, what Officer Gonzalez said is not only were this gang associated with the shooting of Andres Guardado, but there is this subsect, this group of deputies within the Compton uh, Sheriff's Department that are either a part of this gang or, as he put it, quote unquote, chasing ink. Now, Chasing Inc. is almost like being indoctrinated into this group, a group that prides itself on, for the most part, violence. That either being police uh, excessive force by police officers or actually shooting and killing individuals as, Art, De as Deputy Art Gonzalez is claiming happened in the uh, Andres Gordado case. Now, this is something that many have suspected. Even the mayor uh, of that area is coming out and talking about her interaction with the sheriffs and how force was so excessively used against her. Like I said, it is complicated. It is intertwined. There are so many moving pieces. And the best way to figure this out, let's go to our guests. I'm joined with Michael Corbonics as well as Eklund Mercy. Let's talk more about this. Mike Corbonics, let's start with you. This is deep. I mean, we've heard of whistleblowers, but this is a whistleblower, from my understanding, he actually came out when he said enough was enough, when he saw one deputy attacking another deputy, and that's how this whole ball started moving. What are some of your thoughts as we're hearing more reports of this? Well, <clears throat> this is rather, it's shocking, but it's not. Um, it, it's shocking in the fact that this is taking place within law enforcement, and that it has taken so long for someone to come forward. I give the whistleblower, if his allegations are true, a lot of credit because it appears that, you know, we saw in, in, in one of the clips that they actually have computer pads and, and with, with insignias on it, that they're pretty brazen about this and their activities. So I, I give this person a lot of credit because if this is true, I'm sure he's putting himself at risk with this gang. I mean, a gang is a gang. We've all defended gangs and gang members, and they have their own code of ethics and rules. And this person is probably at risk for coming forward. Yeah. Let, let's talk a little bit about that risk, Eklund, because what we're getting reports are that Gonzalez says that he actually uh, called the confidential uh, internal affairs hotline. And he was shocked that within 48 hours of calling that hotline, that uh, that call was immediately leaked, and he heard snippets of that call uh, from ex from the quote unquote executions or deputies. Uh, also, there was graffiti that was put on. Uh, I know many of us kind of see keypads when we go into our job or or into certain communities. Right on that keypad, it said Art, which is the first name of this deputy, or at least a short form of his name. Art is a rat. And so there seems to be some validity, or at least uh, uh, deputies believe in some validity, that he's ratting on other uh, deputies. What are some of your thoughts, Eklund, as we hear more about this whistleblower and the facts that he's bringing forward? 
It's funny when people think like your thoughts are conspiracy theories and they are actually confirmed. Like uh, attorneys who have been working um, as defense counsel, we have known, especially I live in the South, so we know that there is a different sex. And it's funny how it. it I, I used to um, have to subpoena gang experts who um, worked in the police, you know, who worked in the force, and they are gang experts, and they're telling me about tattoos. They're telling me about being jumped or having to um, earn your stripes. They're telling me about how they feel with regards to violence, and they're testifying to that, all the while actually participating in it. The fact that we have law enforcement, and they're not only were they able to create these sex, but they are able to thrive. And we have a president who is actually perpetuating all of it. Um, that RNC, the last, the, the RNC, that was like four days of just like the slave catcher spirit um, just being perpetuated. So we have a problem. It is in our police the police force is the problem because they have they have that that rotten apple it hasn't it's not just one apple it's a whole group of them it's a gaggle of them that needs to be taken out and until we really attack this problem we're going to see police brutality rates um just climb we're going to see the tension between law enforcement and the community climb why because there is no trust in this police force because they not only were they not only are they able to just be there and just just terrorize communities but they're able to thrive that's why i tell i tell all my clients if you have an issue if it's a civil rights issue go to the fbi go to the fbi civil rights department they will take your they will take your your complaints to heart and they will do something about it. The issue is we have a leak system and that's why when he called that 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 uniform number when he called something that's supposed to be um confidential it leaked. Why? Because we cannot trust that system. We definitely need something new. Now, evidence of this secret gang actually first emerged in a wrongful death shooting of Dante uh, Taylor, where Compton deputy Samuel Almada or Al Dama, sorry, uh, was forced to reveal his tattoo. So in court, he actually had to show his tattoo. And he said in a deposition that 28 other deputies at the Compton station had the same tattoo. And as Eklund, you were kind of pointing out, these tattoos in, in, in Rikers, in other jails, in, in gangs, in other groups, these tattoos have a unifying uh, concept between them. And the belief is, at least in the Guardado case, is that the officer who shot him was quote unquote chasing ink or to be indoctrinated into that group. Let's listen to the presser talking more about that shooting. So you see the front of the location, 420 West Redondo Beach Boulevard. The, the driveway and the security gate is partially open. You'll see Mr. Guardado standing with his arm up resting against the, the gate there. You'll see a white Lexus pull up and stop in front of the driveway apron. Mr. Godardo engages the occupants of that car, and then a patrol vehicle approaches, sees Mr. Godardo, it stops. You see Mr. Godardo run southbound down the driveway of the business, and the deputies exit the patrol car and give, give chase on foot. At the end of that driveway is where the deputy involved shooting occurred. Now, the policy of the Compton Police uh, Sheriff's Department, sorry, is that they're not allowed to have gangs within their the, within the department. That's not supposed to exist. But for this deputy, Deputy Art Gonzalez, who's a former U.S. Marine, decorated for his service in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, in 2018, he was awarded the Meritorious Conduct Silver Medal uh, by the LASD uh, for his actions of saving the life of a four-year-old who was uh, shot in the head. I think it was just kind of a grazing, but because of his quick action, he saved that, that, that uh, young child's life. So this is a highly decorated officer uh, who's stepping forward to become a whistleblower. Uh, Eklund, what do you make of this? this kind of stepping forward and, and highlighting uh, something that seems so dangerous to the community at large. And I am here for it. I am so over it. And I think a lot of people are over the whole, we have good cops, not all good cops, like not all cops are bad. And we do have good cops. Well, good cops need to stand up and speak up. And I am happy. I am just in, like, I'm just ecstatic that he took the confidence and he has, he has the history. He has the commendations to stand up. 
a lot of people, a lot of officers are afraid because they've had complaints or because they were um, associated with the group or with the gang and in later parts, and that may come back up. So for him to come out and just speak and then be able to speak about the process, calling the confidential line, finding that it's leaked, getting the threat, um, putting, put, he is literally putting himself and his life out there just to protect the people, and I just commend it. And again, in the press release, Mike Corobonics, we have the Guardado family filing a civil suit saying that these, this, uh, the L.A. County Sheriff's Department and, and the county uh, use excessive force in shooting this young man, this 18-year-old man, uh, five times in his back while he was running down an alley. Uh, of course, the argument being this is excessive force. No one was in immediate danger or of uh, serious physical injury or death. Uh, and also, the, here's the connection that they're tying in that these individuals were, quote unquote, chasing ink as part of the executioners or, as they're also called, the 3,000 boys. Do you think that these allegations of the executioners or the 3,000 boys is going to make this civil claim against the officers that much stronger? Oh, I think it's going to really strengthen the claim. It's going to strengthen on a, on a number of levels. In civil rights practice, there's what they call Manel claims. That is basically what ties the, the, the sheriff's department or any department into the suit, as well as having liability as the individual who, who performed the excessive force. Why it would be important here is if they could show that there was a willful blindness, that people knew about this gang within the department, it was common knowledge, and no one did anything, that is basically saying the department gave a blessing to this. Um, it seems that we have to know how long this has been enforced, because when we opened the show, we saw the clip from the sheriff, who seems to have been, I mean, I, I believe he said 57 employees since he's taken over have been fired or, or taken off the force because of misconduct. However, if this has been consistent and they can show it's been out there, this could be a very, very big case for the plaintiffs. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. We'll obviously keep our eye on it here at the Law and Crime Trial Network. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to be talking about the Rittenhouse case out of Kenosha, Wisconsin, and how the defense is making an argument that it was self-defense. All right, so we've been following both cases out of Kenosha, Wisconsin, but now let's follow just the one of Kyle Rittenhouse. He's the 17-year-old who traveled from Illinois into Wisconsin with an AK-47 and a medical pack uh, to what he said was he was there uh, to help protect a building. Uh, his lawyer went on Fox News and discussed more about the case and the arguments that this could potentially be self-defense. Now, self-defense is afforded to an individual to protect themselves, and I think the argument here is that the individuals, it was first one individual who Kyle Rittenhouse was shot in the head, and then the subsequent two others, one of which who was shot and killed, the other one who was greatly injured by shot in the arm, uh, that the lawyer is saying this was all self-defense. It's an interesting defense. I think it has some merit. However, there are some factual issues that may not allow that case to go forward, but as we have to wait for the facts to come out, and we'll make those arguments as, as they do. But let's listen to the lawyer on Fox talking about how the case played out in his eyes and how the arguments of self-defense apply. This is 100% self-defense, Tucker. Um, Kyle, um, he's a good kid. He's a lifeguard. Um, Kenosha was burning down. Um, Actually, when he got done with work uh, that day, uh, he went to the high school with some friends to try to remove some graffiti. Um, after that, they got a call from a local business person who owns three businesses in downtown Kenosha. Uh, two of those three businesses had been burnt to the ground, and this business owner uh, simply wanted to uh, desperately protect what was left of his life's work, so he asked for help. Kyle and his friends decided uh, that nobody was doing anything to protect that community, and they decided that they would answer that call and help to protect uh, that business. All right, so this is going to be interesting. I think, though, this is a very fact-specific defense. And just right now, we don't have all the facts because one little fact here or there can completely destroy uh, or completely make the self-defense claim. But let's bring in the experts and let's see what we think. Let's start off with Eklund Mercy. Um, Eklund, from what we know so far, 
What do you make of this self-defense claim of an individual who travels into the state of Wisconsin? Now, according to his defense attorney, uh, John Pierce, he did not travel with a gun. Therefore, the federal crime of transporting a gun doesn't apply. He's saying he picked up the gun in Wisconsin or was given... It was given to him, and then he went on to, quote-unquote, defend this property and then also defend himself during this attack. What do you make of this self-defense claim? I, I mean, I, you, have to, you have to shoot your shot, and I guess that's what the defense is doing. However, in this particular climate, what they are also doing is perpetuating more of this. To be real honest, you, as well as I do, know that if, if Rittenhouse was anything other than a white male, he would not have survived that evening. Let's be clear, all right? It is absolutely racial, even the fact that we're bringing up self-defense while um, there are unarmed Black men that are getting chopped down by officers. He was given high fives. So he was given a reason to go out. He was the actual threat. At that point, if I'm if I'm the prosecutor, you're, you're saying that Kyle Rittenhouse was a bomb that with a pin out and they allowed him to walk through the streets of Kenosha. And that was the, he was the actual threat. He wasn't defending anything, but a, but, but a concept of white supremacy. So I, I, I understand why they're doing it, but how they're going about it, 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 it it's just shocking to me. Yeah. And, and Mike Corbanis, let's talk Second Amendments real quick. Uh, there's, one, there's one charge. Uh, that of an 18 year old, uh, that of a 17 year old possessing a gun, where in Wisconsin you're supposed to be 18. Now, the defense, I, I, I love the argument. I love swinging for the fences, trying to get the full acquittal, is trying to make this argument that that charge is unconstitutional because it limits a 17 year old from having the same rights as an 18 year old. Now, we talked about this yesterday, the Law and Crime Daily, and I said uh, Justice Scalia might be rolling around in his grave a little, calling it jiggery pokery, because even he said in uh, the seminal case in Heller that. The Second Amendment is not absolute and that there can be some limitations on it. Is a 17-year-old having a gun, is that an appropriate limitation, I guess, is the question. What are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are this, is that it is an ability to limit constitutional rights. I mean, there's all sorts of things. That's why we have appellate courts, Supreme Courts. There's interpretation. The irony to this all, the irony to this all is that we are talking about, in this day and time, about the ability to train police officers so they properly handle guns, and that hasn't been going very well, as we have seen over the past couple months. Now you're trying to justify a 17-year-old walking the streets, openly carrying an AK-47. It, it, it just, I don't even see how you can make that argument with a straight face. And quite frankly, to that's the least of this young man's problems with the charges against him as to whether or not he had a right to have a gun. The bottom line is he wasn't trained to have a gun, and I think that the defense here should speak less and listen more because as defense attorneys, our obligation is to our client, not to the media, not to some political agenda, but to make sure our client's rights are protected. Whether you believe in what that person did or not, as attorneys, we have an ethical obligation. Just like Dan Abrams wrote in his book about John Adams, he didn't agree with the people he defended as a result of the Boston Massacre, but the bottom line was they're entitled to a defense. I just don't agree with the defense attorney coming out on behalf of his client so early when so many facts need to be sorted through, especially the 17-year-old's mental capacity. Now, Joseph Scott Morgan, um, thank you for joining us. I could see this case being one on either side on what I would call a little bit of jury nullification. Because on one side, you can say, I, I, I would be fearful as a defense attorney. Prosecutor comes up and says, we have these foreigners, the, the people from Illinois and other cities coming into our city and causing a ruckus. Let's convict them. But on the other side, I can see the defense coming up and saying, hey, we go to different countries around this world and we help to give protection. We help to give aid. Heck, I'm a public defender from Canada who came to Brooklyn to help constitutional rights. What leg do I have to stand on about going to different areas to help other people? I can see either argument working in court. How do you think this could play out in a court? Uh, well, you know, it's not like he drove from Cairo, Illinois, down the furthest 
you know, uh, region of Illinois. He he's within you know 20, 20 miles, I think, of this location. It's it's part of the area in which you know he lived. Now, granted, he did cross the state line in order uh, to get there. And now, as to what he was doing when he got there. Uh, I have no idea. And where he got this weapon, I have no idea. But what we do have is videography, you know, from the scene. And this is going to play out because, you know, these these injuries uh, that were inflicted are very grotesque. Uh, you know, the, the headshot was very sudden, uh, but you do have uh, the individual that was shot center mass in the chest, mind you, from an asymmetrical position. Uh, Rittenhauer's on his backside. That's going to be talked about. His perception, I think, is one of the things that the uh, perceptions of danger at that moment in time are one of the things that the defense will exploit. And, um, uh, you know, one of the most telling things uh, is the fellow that uh, approached him that was shot in the arm, uh, one of the clips, you can see he's possessing a handgun. Uh, in that in that particular clip. So we'll see how this plays out and what the perception of the prosecutor's office, the defense, and ultimately potentially a jury would be in this case. Yeah, the, 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 the makeup of the jury is going to make or break this case, like I said, either which way. Let's switch gears just like I, I don't want to leave this case. It was so exciting. But let's talk about a new development in the, Max, the Maxwell uh, Ghislaine case uh, because the Virgin Islands is asking for something that doesn't usually happen a lot, and that is to, uh, sorry, apologies, uh, in the Harvey Weinstein settlement. Uh, we're, we're talking about the potential that the settlement is dropping by about $7 million. Now, it's, it's very complicated. There are a lot of moving pieces. Let me, let me break it down. Class action suits happen all the time. We talk about you get a mug, there's something wrong with it, and it causes everyone to cut their lips. Everyone has a class action suit, right? But the judge is saying that cases like this with sexual harassment and assault cases are not the type that are meant for class action suits. And so, in July, when the, the, uh, the, the settlement offer was $24.3 million, they rejected that. Now they're maybe not so happy because, because of this new term and the, and the fact that it's moving from it can be a class action to it not being a class action, that 24.3 dropped down to 17.1. Now, bankruptcy attorneys are scrambling to try to get that standard of this being a class action suit back to try to bump that 17.1 back to 24.3 and get that global settlement that they want. Um, Mike Korobonics, let's jump in here. Sorry about the mix up with the stories, but we're talking um, Harvey Weinstein, global settlements, no class action. What do you make of this giant departure from going from 24.3 to 17.1? I, I, I don't really understand. I don't understand it other than they probably feel that there's an issue. And I say they, whoever is representing Weinstein, that they feel that they have a weakness in the case against them, meaning the plaintiffs have a weakness because of this class action. And if they settle it now, that that the plaintiffs will take a lower amount since they're really not sure on procedurally how they're going to go forth with this or if they'll come within a class action. As we all know, class actions are very difficult and complicated and expensive, expensive ways of going um, to, through civil litigation because most of the money gets used up by the attorneys, investigation, things of that nature, and the class action leaves only a minute share for the actual people who are harmed. That has been my experience with them. Yeah, and, and um, Joseph Scott Morgan, I mean, this, this is going to be very difficult for those trying to recoup losses because Yes, 24.3 down to 17.1 is a big jump down, but also that means for the smaller people down, when the final dollar amount gets to the individual person, that can be a hefty loss for the individual and it also kind of creates this standard of what is and what is not a class action. I don't know. When we were talking about Harvey, I don't understand this is unique, but we're talking about Harvey Weinstein and his corporation and how that could have done that. Maybe this is a new standard. JSM, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to you. We're going to take a quick break and talk more about this in other cases after this. Good afternoon. Of course, my name is Kenneth Walker. 
My life changed forever in the early morning of March 13th. I was laying in bed with Brianna around midnight watching a movie. All of a sudden, someone started beating on the door. They refused to answer when we yelled, who is it? 15 minutes later, Brianna was dead from a hell of police gunfire and I was in police custody. The police arrested, jailed, and charged me with murder of a police officer. I was raised by a good family. I am a legal gun owner and I would never knowingly shoot a police officer. Brianna and I did not know who was banging on the door, but the police know what they did. The charges brought against me were meant to silence me and cover up Brianna's murder. For her and those that I love, I can no longer remain silent. Thank you. All right, so there we have Kenneth Walker at a presser giving some statements about the... Uh, the, 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 the civil claim that was being filed. Now, just to give you a hint as to what's going on, it's a false arrest, malicious prosecution, and negligence civil claim that he's filing, specifically against the officers for he's saying that he should not have been arrested, the prosecution for saying that this prosecution was malicious in its nature, and also that the officers were negligent in the way in which they handled the arrest. Uh, Michael Korobotics, Tell me about this, this, this case. Do you think this will have any legs on it? The malicious prosecution is the one that really interests me the most, though. Well, I, I think it's going to have legs. I mean, Brian, for years, going back to when I was a prosecutor myself, no-knock warrants where the police just go into a house have always been a concern, not only for defendants, police as well, because it, it, this sort of shows the danger of a no-knock warrant. This is going to be very, very fact-sensitive, as, as most type of these cases are, as to where they're going to go. However, at first blush, it appears to have some very strong legs, and I think they, they may have a very strong claim. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no-knock warrants in jurisdictions that, that allow people to ha legally possess guns uh, and, and even open carry, if you want to go a little bit further, very dangerous for both our men and women in blue, as well as the individual who resides there. Let's listen to a little bit more of the presser, specifically uh, Kenneth Walker's attorney, talking more about this civil claim. There were two separate volleys of gunfire that night, and they were about a minute and eight seconds apart. It was not reported that an officer was shot until after the second volley of gunshots. And yet the police have alleged all along that Kenneth and Kenneth's one shot somehow hit off Somatica. We, we, we absolutely do not concede that fact. It is obviously possible, but until we see the ballistics report and reflects that, then we think it is much more likely that one of the 35 to 45 shots fired by LMPD is what struck off somatically, especially based on the fact that it was not reported that he was shot until over a minute and a half after the raid began. But really, the, the bottom line on this is, is this, is on that night, Kenny Walker was 27 years old. He's from a good family. His father's retired army. His mother's worked for JCPS. Kenny never been in trouble in his life. And the police want you to believe that at almost one o'clock one evening, he says, my first foray into the criminal justice world, I'm going to try to shoot a cop. It's a ridiculous position. What is more believable is they didn't announce they were police, just as a dozen neighbors said, I never heard them say they're police. And then after this goes bad, they have to say, oh, we said we were cops and he had to hear us and therefore he shot us. That, that is, that is the, the inherent inconsistency that throughout this case that it began and when Kenny was charged, and it's still today. It, it, it is not, it is simply not believable. And they knew it wasn't, yet they went ahead and charged him anyway. That's the bottom line on this also is, it is still six months later, and they're trying to determine what happened in that apartment. They arrested Kenny for what they say happened after about three hours. I mean, Joseph Scott Morgan, we're coming up on almost six months since this occurred. In my mind, all I need is this. 
give me the layout of the home, show me where the bullet holes are, show me where the people were when the, when, the, when the shots occurred and where people were standing. And I think that would be the most crucial. Hey, maybe you could do a 3D map for me. Maybe we can get some CGI. I don't know. But is it scientifically possible to show me where the bullets went, where they came from, and maybe when they were shot? Or am I watching too much Star Trek? No, Lord, no. <laughs> no, you're not watching too much Star Trek. It's something that's done regularly. Uh, and, you know, earlier this week, uh, you know, as counsel had mentioned on the, the recording just a moment ago, uh, they're waiting on a ballistics report. Well, apparently the FBI has generated a report. Now, when they say, Brian, when they say ballistics report, okay, that, that means a couple of things. Is this an actual ballistics report where they're looking and and comparing projectiles where they're looking for the lands or the markings on the on the bullets themselves, the spent projectiles? Or is this also going to include, like you said, uh, a shooting reconstruction, which is where, you know, you see us do these things with these fancy lasers where we draw these trajectory lines and we position everybody in, in this, you know, in this chaotic moment. I've worked cases like this. I've even worked cases with, um, uh, no knock warrants where I had a young lady that was killed uh, at in her bed while her boyfriend was going for an AK-47 that was next to to the bed. Um, and it's it's a damn mess. I mean, it really is because you've got rounds traveling everywhere. I suspect uh, that because the state attorney general uh, has called in the FBI, that's one of the reasons this is taking so long. Uh, probably for them to generate this report. I'm anxious to read it personally. I want to see what it has to say, what the positionality of everybody is relative to this poor woman who is now deceased and, of course, this young man that's been charged. Yeah. Now, uh, Eklund, this is going to be interesting because as this civil case goes on, there's going to have to be some level of discovery turned over. Kenneth Walker's discovery can have a direct implication on Breonna Taylor. This could be a way to move one case could move two cases forward. What are your thoughts on that potential happening? Okay. Um, Mike, let, let's, let, let's ask you the same question. We know the civil case is going to be moving forward. As a moving party, Kenneth Walker has the right to ask for that discovery. It's been six months since the public has heard it. Uh, Mike, do you think that this one case could help move both cases along? That's a very interesting question, and it's a very good question, Brian, because it'll be interesting to see the strategy of the uh, city in, in this matter, because they may rely upon not turning over in a civil case, making some sort of claim that it's an investigation it's still undergoing. On the other hand, I think a judge may say, no, this is going to go forward, but you folks will have to keep this, meaning the defense and the plaintiffs, will have to keep this under a gag order and cannot release anything released in the civil case till they make some sort of declaration that the investigation is over. Yeah. Now, now it's, it, it's gonna be interesting how this plays out. Let's listen to a little bit more um, of the presser in connection to this. Uh, again, Kenneth Walker's attorney speaking more on the issue. Everyone has the exact same right of self-defense. Police do not have some sort of heightened right because they wear a badge. If you're in reasonable fear of your life, you are allowed to use self-defense, okay? That, that, that is unquestionable. However, where that goes awry for them is when they recklessly are executing the warrant, then they don't have that right. When, when Hankison is recklessly and blindly firing shots, blindly shoot wherever and say, oh, I was defending myself, I was afraid. So that is where that, that no longer applies. Clearly, Kenny had the right in his own home. Went from laying in his bed watching Freedom, Freedom Riders to 15 minutes later, his girlfriend, you know, the love of his life, is gasping for breath in his lap when he's calling 911. He's been shot at over 20 times, we know. Uh, it's pitch black dark. And then on top of that, he trusted the police officers of PIU who said, hey, we're just here to try to figure out what happened, told them the entire story, and less than two hours later, they've charged him and put him over there in the jail. So his entire life has been changed. Not only is the love of his life gone, 
right? And he has to deal with that. But let's also talk about the potential psychological effects of being shot at that many times in the dark. And the trust or lack thereof now for the criminal justice system and how they treated him. His name is all over the world that they've charged him with this. So that's just the beginning. Okay. So this is, I'm going to field this question to you because this one has been confusing me about the Breonna Taylor case for, for some time, and I think it also is going to have an impact on the Kenneth Walker case. Louisville police officer uh, Brett Hankinson, he was fired. And in a part of him being terminated, the reason that the, the, the police department said he was terminated is because he, quote, wantonly and blindly fired 10 rounds into Miss Taylor's apartment on the night that she was killed. When I hear wantonly and blindly firing shots, I hear reckless homicide, criminal negligent homicide. I don't hear first degree murder, but I definitely hear some form of, of manslaughter there. Why is it that the police report firing him can't be used to also have an indictment or at least find some charges there? Because this is why we have an issue right now, is because here's the thing, the people that actually did the shooting, what's so funny is that um, the boyfriend was arrested within two hours of telling his truth. We know that it was officers that fired 10 rounds, and they, although one has been fired, none of them have been arrested. He was arrested within two hours while leaving the love of his life to gargle for air while she's also an EMT worker. That's what she had, that's what he had to do. Now we have officers who went to the wrong house, who did the wrong um, warrant, did all things wrong, and they killed somebody, and we don't have any charges because of what they look like. Let's be clear. We know why they, they're they officers, and they, they've, had, they've been able to thrive. They've been able to perpetuate all of this. The reason why is that once you bring one down, you're going to bring the whole crowd down, and that's what they're trying to do. I believe that the law enforcement in Tennessee is trying to protect themselves from even a bigger mess because this was bad. The no-knock warrant was already bad. We'll, we can t discuss constitutionalities later, yeah. but the fact that it was a wrong warrant is an issue as well. Absolutely, Eklund. Uh, let's take a quick break and come back with more here at the Law and Crime Trial Network. All right, a suspect, a suspect in the death of a Chicago teen and activist, Caleb Reed, has been arrested in a tragic incident where the group of young men were walking down the street. They had observed a vehicle come up next to them and pause for a moment. One of Mr. Reed's friends pulled out a gun and shot multiple times as they ran away. Individuals in the car shot back. Unfortunately, one of Mr. Reed's friends in shooting while he was running away took a single shot that found, itself, found that bullet in the center of Mr. Reed's head. It is a tragic loss for not only his family but the Chicago community, for this man was trying to do great things in his community in reducing gun violence in Chicago. Let, let's go to Joseph Scott Morgan. This is a case that just has, it, it's just heart-wrenching and has so many issues when it comes to gun violence in Chicago. What are some of your thoughts on the case? Uh, yeah, and it's confusing. I, I hope this young man's case doesn't get lost in the shuffle because, you know, Chicago is awash in blood. We hear it all the time. These poor kids are getting gunned down left and right. And the problem is this, Brian, is that when you have so many cases uh, of people being shot over and over and over again, it diminishes life greatly, and that's that's a horror. It's an absolute horror show. So, hopefully, uh, this this will you know he, he'll have a legacy that's left behind here about what he was trying to do. Yeah, and Genove Martin is the friend who uh, who fired the shot that the police are saying uh, ended up hitting Mr. Reed in the head. He was arrested and. He actually posted on social media after the fact, inquiring if his friend Caleb Reed was safe. Uh, Mike Corbanis, you can tell that there was some worry from this young man about his friend. There seems to be little to no intention for him to actually kill Caleb Reed. But of course, when you bring a gun to a gunfight, you have to uh, be responsible for the, for the, for the tragedy that, that flows. What are your thoughts? This is just horrible. I mean, it's just a horrible situation. It, it's heartbreaking. and. 
it's a difficult situation for this young man because we spoke about earlier about reckless activity with the firearm, and he's going to right now, at least from a probable cause standard, probably fall into that category of a reckless manslaughter or something like that. But to have it be your friend where that was not your intention just goes to show you, once again, people with firearms need training. Yeah. Uh, Acklin, same idea. What are, your, what are your thoughts on this on this case? And it's so sad, these black, young, and in Chicago, it's, it's really sad. It's probably really confusing. I mean, you're afraid of police because police are shooting you. You're trying to protect yourself and just make it through the day. And you do have people that are, you know, trying to shoot you. And in trying to protect yourself, you accidentally kill another friend. That is a fact pattern I, I don't like to see. And we see it often, unfortunately. So my heart goes out to, you know, Caleb's family. My heart goes out to everybody. That is not a situation you want to be in. But we need more answers. Um, we need more solutions. And it's it's just sad. It was it's just sad. Yeah. And and you never we 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 as a society uh celebrate martyrs, but it's always a tragedy when you have a martyr. And and so that the hope is in one sense, out of this tragedy tragedy, the the legacy of Caleb Reed uh can be can outlive this young man. And that the calls to end gun violence in Chicago and the calls to remove uh, police forces inside of the actual schools and have uh, a better social network within the schools to uh, to effectuate change in the way that Caleb Reed wanted. Uh, hopefully that legacy transcends his, his life. Uh, let's switch gears just ever so slightly as we end this show, and let's talk about uh, Ghislaine Maxwell. Now, the Virgin Islands Attorney General wants to get Ghislaine Maxwell's sealed testimony. They believe that that testimony will highlight some of the information in terms of their prosecution and the alleged uh, incidents of hiding uh, money and property in the Virgin Islands that will, uh, that will help their investigation. However, the counter argument is that there is an investigation and also a prosecution uh, in the mainland and here in the United States, the continental U.S., and to release that information could disrupt that trial. It's a balancing act that we always have to face. Uh, Mike Korobonics, what do you think about that balancing act between, hey, we have to investigate crimes that Epstein and, and Maxwell might have done here, but also we've got uh, Maxwell on the hook here. We can't let out too much information. Well, it's, it's a very difficult question because of the fact that you have so many different law enforcement agencies during this investigation. I'm pretty confident that the two uh, bodies will come together and figure out uh, a way to help one another in their investigations. But I think the one in the, that are on the mainland now will probably go forward, and they'll be very careful how they release that information. Yeah. Uh, Eklund Mercy, same question. It's, it's a balancing act. How do we strike that balance in trying to find prosecution in one, in, in one area of the United States while keeping some information under lock and seal to make sure that it doesn't affect another case? Well, I think that Virgin Islands need to use, like, it's an ongoing type of crime. Sex trafficking just doesn't start and just stop. You know, she had a whole operation. So if they have, um, if, you know, if what's sealed can uncover the sex trafficking that is still going on in Virgin Islands, they actually need that information. So if they make that type of argument, I think it could be successful. Yeah. Now, Joseph Scott Morgan, I know during the break, uh, I congratulated you on, on your family success. So I know that you're a man that juggles a lot. We're talking now about uh, the juggling of, of different prosecutors, Virgin Islands as well as here in, 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 in the continental U.S. How do you think that we're going to be able to juggle that? Uh, it extends further further out than the Virgin Islands. Interpol's involved in this case. You've got things that are happening over in Europe that we're not even aware of regarding this case. I think what I would like to end up by saying here or kind of conclude my, where are the children at the end of this? Because, you know, it's been stated openly by Virginia uh, from the interview earlier, there were young girls from Eastern Europe that were involved in this. What happened to those girls? Did they just vanish off the face of the planet? Did they just vaporize into the air? Because many of those, according to her, were brought back to this island. It's a horrific, horrific story, and we can't even begin to think about how many different investigations there are, how many different prosecutions could follow up with this. Oh. 
I want to leave it on that, Joseph Scott Morgan. Where are the children? Because we've got to always keep an eye on the prosecution, but also on the eyes of the victim and the defense. It's something that we all always have to balance. Equin Mercy, Mike Corbonics, Joseph Scott Morgan, thank you very much for lending your voice and your expertise to these many, many issues that we covered today. We're going to be coming back again tomorrow for another Law and Crime Report. However, uh, you make sure to stay tuned for our regular schedule program later in the day. Thank you for joining us all, and we'll see you later here at the Law and Crime Trial Network here, covering cases from coast to coast.